So, Fred, thanks very much for joining us today on 360. Now, of course, last week, the Cardano Foundation released its annual report. Uh, it'd be great if you can maybe take us through what you see as some of the key achievements in 2022. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Yeah, so from a technical infrastructure support to spreading knowledge and established target partnerships and collaborations, it's been a really, really busy year. But I think actually in a certain way, the annual report or the transparency report is actually one thing we've been working on for one and a half, two years. And what we really want to do is we want to sort of start the year and saying, you know, what is it we would like to achieve? What is the hypothesis and where are we going? And then trying and be a bit accountable towards if we do all the things we set forward to do but also kind of take some learnings out of it and say, you know, what can we do different and where do we need to stop because our hypothesis was not strong enough. And I think some of the things we were, you know, we were betting on last year was, for instance, the technical assistance for the community and for the exchanges and the banks and really starting looking at into the common infrastructure of Cardano and seeing how we can actually push that to the next level. So as you probably saw, we did a full rework of the SIPs process. It was important for us that we divided that and kind of upgraded that to the best standard from open source software by basically dividing the problem articulation and the solution suggestion from two, two different aspects. So we have less biases in there and we get way more sort of clarity on what is the problems and what is possible solutions. We were working hard on the developer portal in terms of wider documentation, in terms of also showcases. So we now have over 110 showcases, which is not a lot, but it's very interesting to compare Cardano Cube, which is uh, from the community, which is sort of capturing everything what's happening on Cardano, and then the showcases. And what's so special with the showcases is that the community signs it off based on an approach on GitHub. So it's nearly like an editorial committee. And it's not about having as much as possible. It's about having as much diversity as possible. So if you're looking for a special operating model, you don't need to go through you know, a ton of different similar operating models. You can really start piggybacking on saying, you know, this is how smart contracts has been deployed in that kind of use case. And our goal for this year is that we go you know, from the 110, 13 up to maybe 300 or something like that. And we know there's a lot more out there, but uh, you know, to go through that. And I think that really helped a lot. Another thing is the decentralized application backend we did together with Imurko. It has also been a really good learning, both in terms of cross-collaboration, but also in terms of, of deploying something which makes it easier to run decentralized applications. So it has been quite a lot. And then, of course, the summit was a big thing for us. It was amazing to see in, a, in, a, in sort of a bear market you know, 2,000 people from the whole world coming to little Switzerland. Some of them never traveled outside the United States before. They got a passport. They got on the first, you know, intercontinental flight. And they came to Switzerland to celebrate Cardano, to celebrate the maturity of the blockchain, but also to work together with other projects and be face-to-face -face with each other to solve problems, to, you know, understand regulation, to understand smart contracting language and, and really just push their business models forward. So I think that was also really, really nice to see. Yeah, there's quite a lot in there, actually, when you start unpacking it. So we're quite proud of it. One of the other areas that's also covered in the report is around collaborations and partnerships. Maybe you can outline some of those and, and why they matter. One thing we emphasize in there is a, is a collaboration with the university, and it's, um, it's the University of Zurich. And they were also very present at the Cardano Summit. And I would like to emphasize, you know, I think IOG is the best ecosystem partner there could ever be in terms of academic research. And you see that on the very, very thorough academic papers who's come out. So why is it we are partnering up with the university? Now, we're doing that out of two things. One thing is that for the first time in human history, we are not protecting the data in the same way as we saw in the centralized systems. And that means that suddenly you have free access, whether it's human readable or not, is not the thing, but you have free access to see how data congregates and how things come together. So what we really wanted to do is we wanted to start compare how different community groups and different social systems who live on Cardano, how they compare to other blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum and so forth. And what you see is that the features and the protocol parameters are, are really, really important in terms of whether you actually unintentionally go towards a road of centralization or you unintentionally go towards of incentivizing a certain behavior which is not good for the, for the decentralization of the ecosystem and so forth. So having sort of an unbiased partner who's looking into that but also has the experience 
and, and, and have the bandwidth across different sort of academic fields to look at that is really important for us. Now, another partner which we're highlighting in there is, of course, the agricultural use cases we have with a, a nation state. And uh, we're super excited that we've gone further than just putting agricultural products on the blockchain. But we are now taking that to the next level where we're actually having this supply chain solution being signed off. And what we mean about being signed off is that the, the goal this year is that we built upon what we did last year. And we, the goal is to have 100,000 bottles, not only on the Cardano blockchain, but actually have the agricultural ministry signing off the quality and the processes this export wine has to go through to actually be there. And that means that we're now working around verified credentials, DITs, but also um, in the old time we call it Oracle solutions, right? So we're really talking about how do we, we change the narrative of how you use the blockchain for different use cases. So I think that's, that's amazing. And it also showcases their spirit, but also their culture out there. And then obviously United Nations Humanitarian Crisis Organization. So what we did last year, which is also mentioned in the report, is that we, we worked together with the World Trade Organization. We worked together with the World Economic Forum and also the World Bank and UN and so forth. And we were ensuring that the Cardano blockchain was recommended by some of these large organizations who looks at these sort of extremely complicated multinational supply chains. So we were actually recommended by the World Trade Organization. And now with the United Nations Humanitarian Crisis Organization, we think it's extremely important in the world we live in today, not only to do something for displaced people, but actually also thinking about how can we change the operating model of something like United Nations? So I think a, a key point here is that we took innovation, which is done by the community, which you know we would not have come up with, which is this idea of initial stake pool operators. And we then added to that into a new way of funding United Nations Humanitarian Crisis Organization for Switzerland. But more importantly, they're going to take 20% of the rewards they gather in there, and they're going to invest that into the infrastructure. So basically putting Cardano and blockchain into the engine room of how they run their operations. And that would, of course, allow us to do uh, use cases with them where they suddenly can uh, deploy voting mechanisms about, you know, when I give a grant to them, should it be uh, more towards a specific country or should it more be towards an investment in a theme? Should it be towards a specific situation? So you sort of get this inclusive accountability to a certain extent and you get, you know, choice. But it also allows them to be hopefully lower the cost of transparency, even though it's, it's, it's pretty good with UN already. But it's, it, it will probably, you know, appeal to a certain new segment who's not sort of been, you know, appealed to, to this kind of charity before. So we are hoping to find a good win-win situation with somebody who actually already has deployed blockchain solutions sort of for the distribution layer and now really start thinking about how do we lower the total cost of operations for an organization like that and enhance what they can actually do. So I think that's really, really cool. And uh, you can already see the, the start of that with the stake pool being live and you, you, know, you see the first sort of use cases coming out of that and, and so forth. So that's, um, that's really nice to see. It actually ties back to one of the things we're, we're putting a lot of emphasis on for the Cardano Foundation for 2023. And we have sort of this notion that if it exists on the blockchain, it exists. If it doesn't exist on the blockchain, it doesn't exist for us. So we're trying to basically go through every department we have in the Cardano Foundation and saying, okay, is there a way that we can put what you do on the blockchain in such a way that the, the community or the regulator or the supervisor can have some added benefit in actually verifying that it lives and the work has been done. Now, that's not possible to do with everything we do, of course, right? But, uh, you know, in the finance department, we, we're actually taking a huge step because we want to be even more transparent. And we said we're going to insource financing. And by insourcing financing, what I mean about it is instead of, you know, being as cheap as possible, use an external CPA. We're basically taking it back in-house, having our own accountant, our own CFO. And then what we're doing right now is we are creating what's called an accounting policy. With that accounting policy, which is very standard, by the way, we can actually express that in Pluto's code and express that in a so-called finance event on the blockchain. So our hope is that we get to a situation that we can actually retire the centralized general ledger or the accounting ledger, which every company needs to have, 
and then we start using the Cardano blockchain and really show what a financial system can be. So we will then basically portray all finance events from the foundation on the blockchain. We will then export it into an extraction layer because we need that for the audit to build the balance sheet, and then we will post that back into the blockchain, and then everything will be through an explorer sort of visible. Now, that doesn't mean that you can check up everybody's salary and so on, but it gives you a complete different level of showing transparency out there. And our bet is that if we do that, we will find companies around the world where the cost of doing that would be too high. But if they get that sort of as public source or open source software and they get the learnings from us, we might get to a situation that every single company out there can be much more transparent, much more accountable towards their actions. But we would like to get up in a situation that by 2023, that not only is the architecture on paper, but we actually start seeing the first test transactions and so forth on the actual Cardano blockchain. So that's just sort of an example of how we look at eating our own tools, uh, using our own tools and living by our own tools. And I think that's really important uh, because it's about going first sometimes and really showing what's actually possible and showing the art of the possible. So indeed, Fred, and of, of course, the Cardano Foundation has long talked about the need for transparency and accountability in these things. And I suppose the annual report is also part of that same journey. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, We actually wanted to launch one last year, but then, you know, there was huge market corrections and so forth. And then we ended up in a situation where we, we were just a bit too late to the market. So we actually said, OK, it doesn't reflect really what we did. And it was probably more questions than answers. So uh, we took the task up for this year, and I'm extremely proud that it's out. And we already captured some good feedback in the annual report where people are saying, you know, you're speaking a lot about what worked well. Why don't you speak about what didn't work so well? So, we, so I think that's one of the things we, we'll be taking on board and uh, in the next sort of interviews and streaming things we do, we will try and, you know, highlight a few things which clearly didn't work so well in our strategy. But uh, luckily speaking, we had a lot of success. Nine out of 10 things worked really well. But there's a couple of key things where we, we took some hard learnings. And one of the other successes, of course, is in the area of education. You've recently launched your first blockchain course. We've been working with regulators around the world and policymakers for quite some years now. And we put forward that hypothesis that wherever you are in the world, it must be possible to operate with ADA without kind of thinking about, am I in a legal vacuum here? You know, am I allowed to hold ADA? Can I deploy ADA? What can I do with it, right? And ADA is the entry barrier um, to the Cardano blockchain. Now, what we saw is that the, many of the regulators and policymakers and auditors and all of the, let's say, the, a little bit the boring part of the population, which is a part of my job to, uh, to work with, they learned blockchain by looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum. And what we actually represent as Cardano is a, is a third generation blockchain. That means that we're not just talking about one type of identity. We're not talking about one type of governance. And we're not talking about one type of asset representation. We're talking about multiple types of identification, multiple types of asset representation, not just financial, and multiple types of governance, including metadata on chain. And that means that you know, some of the, the hard work which is being sort of produced around these sort of regulatory components is really just looking at Bitcoin. And yes, Bitcoin did change the world, but it does not reflect the possibilities of what Cardano can do. And when we then started working with some of the universities, which was giving the courses and teaching, you know, uh, some of these people who were doing this hard work, we saw that this was the fundaments. So what we said is, that could we get to a situation that we could actually launch free education for everybody around the world, which was accurate and sort of in-depth, taking you from no blockchain knowledge to a sufficient blockchain knowledge that you at least can download the blockchain, that you understand how to do a query, that you can do something meaningful on it. And meaningful, unfortunately, is the scope right now is not uh, a smart contract and, and teaching you coding. What we will then have is we will have the opportunity to, uh, if we do that ourselves, that we can basically give that for free to universities, to ambassadors, to anybody out there who's looking at this kind of content as valuable. So the beauty about being a non-for-profit organization is that we don't necessarily need to earn some money on it. We just need to enable people to do so or enable people to change their point of view so they adopt blockchain. So our goal here was really about, you know, how, how do we get the universities to take our content and put that into their slides, into their presentations. So when they go out to these representatives, they are now teaching third generation blockchains and so forth. The whole trick here is the scripts. So what we want to get to is a situation where we give these scripts away. 
So if you need that in Chinese, an ambassador can take it, translate it into Chinese. He can do sort of a, an app on top of that, sort of a learning app for Chinese school students with a gamified, you know, earn to learn model, right? And we've basically enabled them to do that because we've done the hard work and the hard work is to do that. So we launched the Alpha program and I really encourage you if you have the opportunities to go in and check that out. It's about five hours and we're now collecting the feedback from the community about sort of the quality of the content the delivery of the content and the platform of the content. And then based on that, the idea is we are rolling out module one and module two this year. And module one is sort of third generation blockchains and module two is really Cardano. And that includes sort of the utility functionality around chain indexers and other things which is really needed to work on Cardano. So that's the goal that we're going to get that out in 2023, including a certification process. You already probably saw that in the Alpha program, there's sort of a light certification you can get on it. But we want to have a, a bit more of a deeper certification, which again will allow enterprises and others who need to justify that they take time off to learn something as relevant as blockchain, right? They sometimes need a, a diploma or something like that, right? That we can justify that they can take some time out of their the daily eight to four and actually get on board of what we know is going to be the future of the world. Great initiative, Fred. Last question, 2023, looking ahead. Governance is obviously going to be a very significant theme and topic. Perhaps you can share your thoughts on where you see that going. So obviously we are, we're working quite close with, with IOG uh, around Voltaire, but also with the community around uh, you know, the expression of Voltaire. But we actually think that governance starts even earlier than that. So if we look at the, the maturity of blockchains and operating models around blockchains, if I may steal the phrase that you know, enterprise blockchain is dead, long live blockchain for enterprises. What I mean about that is that we sort of seen that these permissioned private blockchain plays they're not really paying off. A lot of the ancillary infrastructure which is built around that, like DITs and VCs and stuff like that, really works. But the core layer, the foundational layer, does not scale. The total cost of ownership is too high and it does not change the game theory and the mechanics of companies working together and people working together across culture, across nations and across sort of income levels. So... More and more of the RFPs we are looking at and more and more of the demand really goes towards public permissioned or public permissionless blockchains, which we are, of course, incredibly grateful for because we represent probably the strongest public permissionless blockchain infrastructure there is. And on top of that, the sidechain play which is coming is really important. But when you look at governance and some of the questions you're getting is that it's sort of like a talk of war. And what people are starting to understand now is this sort of this notion that if you have a couple of stake pool operators, it's very easy to get a 50% attack on them. So you have sort of the stake pool operators on one end. They're actually the operators of the blockchain. And you need diversity of the infrastructure, you need diversity of thought, you need diversity of operations, and you need to have a striving ecosystem around that. So that's the one end of the sort of the talk of war, right? The sort of human component of the expression of running the technology. Now, the other part of the talk of war is sort of the public roadmap. So the, 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 if you think about the node and the, the core repositories, and, and that allows you in a, in, a, in a certain way to run nearly like a centralized version of the software compared to open source software. And sometimes that pulls in a different direction because, you know, there needs to be, you know, a, a trade-off between what the stake pool operator sees as being safe and secure software compared to what the public roadmap and, and whoever builds something great who goes into the node decides to be the node. And then on the other end, you actually have the actual users. And the actual users of it is now suddenly not just people who are sort of thinking around with issuing a new token or doing tokenization and so on. We're actually seeing that you know, people are putting you know, large critical infrastructure components or are seeking to do that on a blockchain. And when they're doing that, they are asking three questions, which is how predictable, how reliable, and how resilient is that infrastructure? So if you imagine this talk of war, you have sort of these three components who is pulling in each that direction. Yeah. And if you give too much power to sort of the people who live on top of the blockchain and is, need to rely on the blockchain and need to sort of trust that this you know, outsource infrastructure will also will be there tomorrow, you're actually creating a security risk around what the stake pool operators find acceptable and unacceptable, right? And on the other hand, you know, if you have some, you know, how do you prioritize the wishes of what you want to have? Because Cardano is built for change. And that means that 
the society changes as we learn more about, about use cases and blockchain. That's also why we're putting out this educational initiative. You know, there's a, a need for having new features like Mithril or Minotaur and other things, quantum resistance. And, and this is actually this talk of war. And what we see is that not only is our community really talking a lot about Voltaire, but we see all these external stakeholders like governments and nation states and Fortune 500 companies, but also very simple companies like a, like a fintech company with 100 people. They have a huge interest in understanding these incentive mechanisms and how this talk of war is happening. And that is really, really important that we get that right. And we will not get that right in the first show. And that's why, again, Cardano is so special, because we have these protocol parameters. And these protocol parameters allows us some flexibility. And by having the SIP1694 in place and really express the intent of Cardano, we will allow that there can be sort of multiple versions of the truth of governance on the edge cases where the center of Cardano really will be stable and be you know, resistant to a, so a toxic change. And I think that's where we look at it from where we're coming from. And I think that's, that's you know, incredibly important. And I would not be surprised if, if somebody will actually get a, a Nobel Prize based on some of the work which is done on governance and blockchains. And who knows, it might be Cardano. That's all I have to say, Fred. Fred, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Tim.